RCAs, MPAs, NCAs, and other acronyms, because in the conservation world, we love to use indecipherable language for everyone. Um, Dana actually touched on quite a lot of what I'm going to go through, even the Edgar paper, so I should have told you the email beforehand, but to be honest, I didn't start this presentation until this week. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how RCAs and MPAs overlap, if they overlap, whether they can work together, um, whether RCAs can contribute to MPAs, uh, and the contribution they can make uh, to marine conservation in Canada and BC specifically. Do you, want to, do you want to define your acronyms just for fun? I will do as I go through. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the first acronym I'm going to uh, define for you is CPAWS. Because uh, when I say Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, I often get Parks Canada. Um, so just to let you know a little bit, I'm not from Parks Canada. Um, we are an environmental nonprofit. We're nationwide. Uh, we're across Canada. Uh, it's 50 years old nationally. Uh, 20. 28 something in BC. Um, our focus is on protecting public lands and waters, that's largely national parks and marine protected areas. Uh, we seek science based solutions, we practice respectful advocacy, and we work with scientists, with stakeholders, and with governments to inform decision making and make sure that we get strong conservation policy. So, the first of those acronyms uh, MPAs, marine protected areas. Um, MPAs are a spatial, um, ecosystem-based management tool. Um, they are not species-focused. The idea is you are protecting an area and everything within it and the ecological relationships between them. MPAs are permanent because they are legislated. Um, they can vary considerably in terms of levels of protection. So you will get some MPAs that are multiple use, some MPAs that are completely no-take, so there is uh, no fishing, no oil and gas, no uh, removal of any, um, any substances at all. Um, and then you'll get some MPAs that are zoned. Uh, in some areas, um, such as Great Barrier Reef, there are areas that are no-go. So you can't even get in there. Um, the idea of marine protected areas, are rather than trying to address particular species conservation issues or particular threats, you try and address everything in one area through integrated management. So you look at the cumulative impacts of all activities within that area. MPAs are generally tried and tested. I'm not saying that they work 100% of the time in 100% of the places, because they don't. There are good and there are bad MPAs. Um, one thing they've been found to be particularly beneficial for are species that don't tend to move very far uh, and don't migrate very far. Um, rockfish being a prime candidate, or most species of rockfish. Um, and they're also useful for restoring age and size structure in populations because they're permanent, so ideally they should be in place for a long time. Uh, they also have a role in terms of providing refugia for species in climate change scenarios, um, and also supporting ecological resilience because we are protecting areas and ecological interactions. Um, we have in Canada been working on a site by site basis for MPAs. So, as Dana was just saying, DFO puts out fires, they throw money at fires. So, it's what's the important area? What do we need to protect? Let's put an MPA here. What's the important area over here? We should protect that. Um, one thing that we're pushing for uh, and that has been done elsewhere is strategic MPA network planning. So, instead of panicking and, and addressing one issue at a time and spending 20, 30, even more in some case years trying to get one particular MPA done, the idea is that you look at a large section of coastline, you look at all the values there, you look at areas where you have potential um, for a marine protected area and you create uh, strategic networks. Um, Canada has committed to protect 10% of our coast and ocean by 2020. That's the uh, HE uh, UN Convention on Biological Diversity target. So it's us and about 200 other countries. Um, the government has made some very, very strong commitments. Oh, my line is gone. Um, and I will come to those commitments in a little while. So Dana reviewed some of this earlier. There are good MPAs, 
MPAs and there are bad MPAs, there are things that we know work better um, and there are um, guidelines in developing MPAs. MPAs generally are better when they're large, which um, the Edgar paper that uh, Dana referenced earlier said over 100 square kilometres. Um, most of our MPAs are actually quite small. Um, they are better if they are fully protected, so no take. They are better if they are old, which again, Edgar said, older than 10 years. Um, they need to be well enforced. They need to be strategic. So we need to put MPAs where we need MPAs, not where they are easy to put in place. There is a tendency to take the path of least resistance and look at where fishing doesn't occur, where ships don't need to go, where we don't really need to put an oil terminal on the coastline. And the argument is that that's not how we should be picking these sites. We should be picking these sites based on what we want to protect and what we want to achieve. Uh, there are also some other little golden rules, particularly important for MPA networks and also for rockfish conservation areas, uh, looking at connectivity between habitats. So you've probably heard uh, the concept of wildlife corridors on land so that species can uh, migrate between areas in the same way that you need to protect kind of habitat A and habitat B that a species might use on land and the area in between, it's exactly the same in the water. You need to protect juvenile habitat, you need to protect adult habitat, and you need to make sure that they can move between the two safely. You need uh, representativity in your MPA network. So you need to make sure that you have all species and all ecosystems that you want to protect represented within that MPA network. Um, if DFO said, we're going to do an MPA network, we're going to just, just use the rockfish conservation areas because they're all in place. That's great, maybe, possibly great, maybe not that great, uh, for rockfish, but it's not going to help other species. Um, so you need to make sure that you have the broad range of, of ecosystems protected, and you need to make sure that you don't just have one sample of those ecosystems protected. You need replication, because something really horrible could happen in that one area. If you've got three or four copies of it, um, then you are sort of banking that it is a, a sort of a safeguard for the future. Um, one of the other benefits of marine protected areas are that when there is a management plan developed, um, that management plan is regularly reviewed, hopefully. Um, sometimes five years, sometimes 10 year periods seem to be the what's being used in Canada, but there is this idea of re-evaluating later on, is this actually working, does this management plan work, do we need to improve it? All my headings have gone squiffy, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> I was like, no, it's okay, I'm just going to PDF it, it's just pictures, there's no animation, it will be fine. Um, it's not working. Um, Marine protected areas are also known um, as marine reserves, marine parks, marine sanctuaries. Uh, sometimes these will mean different things. So often uh, marine sanctuaries and marine, res marine reserves are used uh, by some people to uh, suggest that it's a no-take area or it's got a higher level of protection, whereas a marine protected area can be one of those multiple use uh, zoned areas. Um, there are a whole host of other titles given to different types of marine protected areas um, and it gets really confusing really quickly when you try and evaluate what happens in these. We have ecological reserves, aquatic reserves, world heritage sites and um, I'm going to come to this a little bit later on but every year we do uh, an annual oceans report and we started off two years ago trying to look at all the MPAs in Canada. Um, we ended up with a data set from um, Environment Canada and we ended up with a data set from uh, the World Database on Protected Areas um, and we ended up with a database from uh, the Marine Conservation Institute for an NGO in the US and <laughs> nothing matched. They all had something like, no, we, do, we, do, we don't count that as an MPA because it's only provincial. DFO said it, even though it's a provincial area, um, it still counts as an MPA. We have to kind of figure out what the definitions are, what do we count as an MPA, um, and what criteria are we going to put in place. It gets complicated because um, 
Our coasts are incredibly complex, um, and none more so than jurisdictionally. Uh, the province owns the seabed to a certain point. Uh, DFO is in charge of transport and fisheries. Uh, the province has aquaculture, uh, and in some reasons, uh, in some regions, muni the municipalities will own a stretch of shoreline. Uh, up in Prince Rupert, uh, where they're going to put in the big terminal, that's the Prince Rupert port owns part of the land that's in discuss. Like it gets super complicated. Who owns what and who has uh, say over it? Generally. Um, our line when we've been doing this analysis is in Canada, we need it to be federally designated because we need transport and we need fisheries and we need oil and gas um, exploration to be managed. Um, so provincial, uh, provincial ecological reserves and provincial aquatic reserves and in Quebec they have wetland something or others and everything has a different title are a really great start. They're very important to protect some values, particularly along the shoreline. But those provincial ecological reserves, more often than not, have no teeth when it comes to managing what fisheries can take place within them, particularly commercial. For that reason, we narrow our focus usually to uh, three types. We have marine protected areas, as they're called, where, which are established by Fisheries and Oceans Canada, DFO, under the Oceans Act, that's a governing piece of legislation. Um, Parks Canada has a National Marine Conservation Areas Act, and they can use that to designate National Marine Conservation Areas. And Environment Canada um, can designate Marine National Wildlife Areas. Haven't actually designated any Marine National Wildlife Areas yet, they've been working on one for a really long time. Uh, hopefully, they'll finish it fairly soon. So, they were MPAs, and we've talked about RCAs, and what's the difference? Well, an RCA is spatial protection, just like an MPA. However, um, it is a fishing closure. So, it is not designated under the Oceans Act, or one of those big pieces of legislation. Uh, and technically, it's not permanent in legislative terms. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the focus for an RCA is a single speed well. It is rockfish. Um, the, the intent is to alleviate further rockfish declines. The purpose is not to protect rockfish and their habitat and the species on which they depend. And as Dana showed the DFO website, which it took me a few times to read it, first of all, when I was first coming up to speed with RCAs, like, are these the ones that are allowed or not allowed? Or what's going on? Um, an awful lot of fishing activities are still permitted uh, in a rockfish conservation area. So there is no protection of ecological habitat um, or relationships. I'm going to use one example. If you're going to put an RCA over a glass boundary, for is going to love this example. <laughs> um, you can't target rockfish, because it's a rockfish conservation area, but you can drop a prawn trap on top of that glass boundary and completely crush the glass sponge, which provides habitat for the rockfish uh, and also for prawns and other things that they will eat. So there is like a, a logical issue there. Um, they also don't restrict any other activities. They say nothing about dumping, about dropping your anchor, about vessel traffic over the top. It's only the hook and line fisheries that would target rockfish. Um, and I had a very interesting chat with Ben earlier about um, the lack of protection of habitat from the bottom up um, and <coughs> the protection from the top down, which means you have increased numbers of lingcod, because you still can't fish for lingcod in those areas. The lingcod eat the rockfish. The habitat isn't being protected, so there's kind of a bit of a pinch point going on, perhaps in some cases, where rockfish are actually getting a harder deal for a rockfish conservation area, um, because their predators are increasing, but their habitat itself isn't getting protected. So, uh, looking at the Southern Strait of Georgia, jumping back to MPAs, we have one particular type of marine protected area, a National Marine Conservation Area, which has been proposed for this area. And this is a campaign that CEPOS 
has been working on for many, many, many years, as Natalie can attest, <laughs> as I'm sure she worked on it before. Um, the marine park, or a marine park for this area was first proposed back in 1969. That was the first time someone said, oh my god, values are declining, we might lose everything if we don't protect this area. 1969, and it's still not being designated. In 1993, Parks Canada did, it, did a representativity study for this area to identify which is the most high value area that we want to protect within the, the Strait of Georgia. Uh, we held a workshop in 1997 um, to further build on that representativity study. Um, initially, when the representativity study was completed and when there was sort of first talk of uh, uh, NMCA, it was a very, very small area, kind of just around the, the Southern Gulf Islands. There was another proposal, if I can use the there was another proposal for an MPA um, up by Gabriola, um, and eventually uh, they were convinced with a lot of hard work from the Islands Trust uh, and from various conservation groups to connect those two areas and do one big MPA, because as I mentioned earlier, bigger MPAs work better than small sites. Um, Canada and BC signed a memorandum of understanding to move ahead with uh, the proposed National Marine Conservation Area in 2003. In 2004, they began a feasibility study. It's still going. It's now 11 years old. Uh, people will have gone to college before I think that gets done. Um, in 2011, they moved this proposed boundary. Um, since then, nothing much has happened. Uh, it has been very, very slow progress. Uh, very little has happened, and there are several reasons for that. Um, when Parks Canada released the boundary, that's pretty much all they did. They just put a line on a map and said, this, this is it. Ta-da! This is what we're going to do. And stakeholders quite rightly went, well, what does that mean? Like, is the whole area going to be no take? Or is some like well, what what's going on? Can I drive my boat through there? Or can um, that led to a lot of industry opposition? So we have pushback from some sectors, um, particularly the shipping industry, who have been very very vocal opponents to it. Uh, we also have internal troubles. Um, staffing changes are very very frequent within government departments. Uh, we just had one this summer, um, so we have a new project manager on the case now. And then we have the uh, ongoing problem of political cycles and political agendas. So you will have all of a sudden the BC government's like, go, 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 we want a protected area. And then the next minute they'll have a bit of a falling out with the federal government and the NMCA gets held hostage. No one will sign anything, no one will move anything forward. Um, and then the BC government will decide they want it again and then the federal government will get peed off with the provincial government and they will hold it hostage. And then on top of that you have political cycles, so every time there is an election everything slows down. At the moment we have a new federal government, which as Dana said has come out with some very lofty MPA commitments. Uh, this we hope will be one of those MPAs that will get finished finally because of that. Um, however we are approaching our provincial election cycle, so once again everything will slow down. So some of us old guys are going to be dead. No, we're going to be dead, we're going to be dead by then. No. No. Or they're going to kill me first. I don't know. Well, uh, so my favorite quote is the, uh, the Jacques Cousteau quote on, we have to protect this area before it's lost. And it's like, sorry, we didn't get that in before he disappeared. Um, we think currently the government is developing what they call a draft concept for the NMCA. We're not quite sure what that means. Um, it, it will hopefully provide some kind of information on how they think this area will be managed. That's all we know. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. As I said, changing staff slows everything down. Um, so what sort of thing do we do to support the NMCA? Uh, well, we have been working for a couple of decades now to get it done. Um, and our focus is ensuring it gets A, completed, and B, gets completed to a high standard of protection. We want this to be a really good marine protected area. 
We work with the Southern Strait of Georgia Marine Conservation Network with groups like Galliano Island Conservancy um, and lots of other island conservancies. Um, and our focus is building public, political, and stakeholder support. Um, to help do this and to help inform decision making, we have done some analytical work on the area with um, Rosalind Knessa at UVic. Um, and I'm going to talk you through some of that work we've done. Can I ask a quick question? I sure. I don't know if you've covered this, but um, what exactly that area, mm -hmm. what, it, what would it be possible to observe? What would be limited or limited or, like you said, right? No. Nope. That would be the draft concept we hope they would so be they're saying. Not going to find an area they have to talk about what it's used to serve what it's not. Yeah. They, they have done a marks and analysis, we also, because what we tend to do is uh, we will, as a conservation sector, set higher targets and have a slightly different focus. Um, the idea being that, that we will um, push the standard and the benchmark up a little bit, like that's really great, but if you increase your protection levels, this is what it could look like. So we tend to come out with uh, the strong conservation vision for the area that will kind of um, offset the government's they analysis. Possibility of zones, yeah. So they will do a zoning plan, um, but they Parks Canada doesn't have even zoning guidelines developed yet. So they said it will be zoned, but we don't know what, how big those zones will be or where they will be. That's another huge process as well. Yeah. Maybe I might just add because mm -hmm. we were involved in that conversation a little bit. And the Islands Trust is uh, uh, actually has the zoning regulatory uh, mechanism in place. It's lots of debate about how effective it might be. But most of the islands within this whole area have zoning some distance out from shore. And what we're suggesting to those that are thinking about this is that they should adopt the existing zoning is a place to start rather than starting from scratch because most of the islands have already figured out what the important values are around there. Yeah, and that is something that, that we would support. Um, so when we did this, the exercise was really to look at what we might develop as a zoning plan. That was how it first started out. Uh, it was looking at the different ecological values in the area. Rockfish conservation areas were one of the many data layers that we use. So we use spatial, we, Rosalind, used uh, a whole host of spatial data layers from bird colonies to seal haulouts to eelgrass and kelp bands um, to rockfish conservation areas and critical habitat for southern resident killer whales. Um, and lay this information up to identify what we called hotspots. Um, we then, just last year, asked Rosalind to overlay those hotspots that were identified um, with human activity so we, we could identify um, areas that really need protection perhaps and areas that might be low hanging fruit. Um, and we also looked at how those hotspots worked with, um, or how they overlapped the RCAs within the area. And I'm really interested, I would love to go back and look at the, your grading of the RCAs and see how, how that would change things. That would be fantastic. Um, in the end, we focused on the hotspots, or we decided to use hotspots at this point as a communication strategy rather than release a proposed zoning plan. Uh, because we haven't seen anything from Parks Canada yet, there is a lot of industry opposition, so the uh, decision was made to be somewhat strategic and not put all of our information out there. We don't necessarily want to show all our cards to the shipping sector so they can go pachoom, pachoom, pachoom and shoot everything down. Um, that was my fantastic gun impersonation. I'm from the UK, we don't have many of them. Um, well, we didn't anyhow a few years ago. Uh, so this is the kind of information that went in. As I said, we've got the killer whale, critical habitat. Uh, we have the RCAs, herring spawn index, um, glass sponge reefs just off the island. 
off uh, Maine and, and Galliano Islands. Um, and then when that data was layered up, and I'm not going to try and explain how Mark Sam works because I did a little while ago and I'm not very good at it, rather than hung her head in shame as I was trying to <laughs> uh, describe it. Basically, we come up with a bunch of areas that the computer selects on a, a number of trials again and again and again and again as these are the really important areas. Um, and this is one of the communications pieces that came out of that was identifying these 21, 20 different hotspot areas um, that we can tell a story about to people. We can start talking to um, the public about values. We can start building up a sense of um, connection with those areas and the species that have found that. Um, obviously, many of the species, like southern resident killer whales, move pretty much every world, they move through a ton of them, but, um, but it still helps create that sense of place. Rosalind then used now, I'm going to caveat this with, this is old data, 1993 to 2004, um, data from the BC Marine Conservation Atlas, um, over those hotspots, just to look at exactly how many activities are taking place, like are any of these going to be a real challenge to get through? Um, are any of these actually relatively untouched by human um, activity? The answer was none of the <laughs> none of the Strait of Georgia was untouched by human activity. I don't know if you remember Jenna, but when she was pulling up those maps, it's just like, wow, the whole area is used intensively. Um, it was quite breathtaking. Uh, includes data on things like shipping, and also recreational data because this is a big part of the National Marine Conservation Area, it would support recreational uses um, that are sustainable. We then had um, a student at uh, SFU in the, the R, in the Resource and Environmental Management Program um, take the hotspots and he overlaid the rockfish conservation area so we could kind of see do the rockfish conservation areas pick up most of the hotspots we identified or vice versa? Um, so what you're looking at is uh, green areas are rockfish conservation areas, but not hotspots that were picked up in our analysis. Uh, orange areas are areas that were picked up in our analysis, but aren't rockfish conservation areas. Red is where you have the overlap between the two. Um, and there was a fair bit of, bear in mind that we looked at a much bigger area, we weren't restricting ourselves the rockfish conservation area, so there's a lot more orange. There is fairly good overlap between some of those, with the exception of Trincomalee. And I'm not quite sure why that one didn't come up with any other data. We were... <laughs> that's quite possibly it. We are at the mercy of what we have data for as well, so there can be values there that we just don't have spatial data for. Uh, we did use a bit of a, um, a peer review process. We brought together the island conservancies that we worked with and we had everyone look over this and then some areas, so it actually didn't come up very well in here, but Sansom Narrows, um, Salt Spring Island Conservancy went, absolutely yes, Sansom Narrows is an important area. It didn't come up in our analysis for some reason or another. Um, the same with uh, Saanich Inlet. Um, didn't really pop out as strongly as it should do, but we still recognise that there are values there, we just don't have data for them. Can any of your like, conservation with people like, people are fishing? So no, we focused on, um, we focused on, this was uh, what would be coming out of the conservation sector. So, it is up to Parks Canada to do that level of consultation with the fishing sector, although it is a good point that the fishing sector and fishermen could do a lot of ground truthing on these values. Um, we have limited time and we have limited budget, so we did the best that we could with the conservation sector. It would, would be really interesting to sit down where the fishermen would be saying, sure, yeah, this is a really, this is, there's tons of rockfish there, there's tons of fish, yeah, I fish there all the time. You should totally protect it, make it a no-take zone. That's it. There's a certain bit of pragmatism about will, that, will those discussions actually take place. However, there is a lot of information there that we haven't had access to. Um, we can't do everything. God, my titles went super messy. 
So, what can rockfish conservation areas contribute to the NMCA? Well, there is obviously a good basis for, um, uh, for the zoning scheme. Um, there is that strong overlap with the hotspots. And again, I'd be really interested to look at the most effective RCAs and the habitat, whether, it, whether they're actually capturing the habitat, um, whether the habitat is also captured in the rest of our hotspots. It would be very interesting to look at. Um, the other thing to consider is that uh, the NMCA, as well as the RCA supporting the NMCA, the NMCA can support the RCAs. Uh, the NMCA can provide an overarching plan for the whole area. I think that was Peter's line when I was out on the boat with him the other day, that this area needs a plan, and something like a National Marine Conservation Area can provide that. Um, the RCAs are obviously valuable habitat, mostly, hopefully, some of, um, and they are key species that we do want to protect, so it is an important part of it. Um, I would hope that their incorporation into the National Marine Conservation Area would also see increased protection for some of those RCAs. So we would see some of those other potentially harmful fishing activities actually banned um, within those so that we can see what full protection in one of those areas would do. Um, and there also remain questions about monitoring, enforcement, assessment of these areas. Um, maybe it's wishful thinking. DFO isn't really doing a great deal of enforcement or education. Would it be any different from Parks Canada? I would like to think so, but I'm not going to make any bets on that one. Um, on a broader scale, what can RCAs contribute to MPA networks um, and marine protected areas in general? Um, we need MPA networks to meet our international obligations. There is no way are we going to get 10% of our coastline protected unless we actually start working on strategic network planning. Um, the BC Canada MPA strategy was released in 2014. Uh, it looks very glossy, nice pictures. It's nice and high level. It's a little bit on the fluffy side. It's not got a lot of teeth to it, uh, but it is a good start. There is a commitment from the two governments to work together. Uh, and we are seeing this actually play out now uh, with there is a marine, let's get this wrong, it used to be the Marine Protected Areas Implementation Team. It is now the Marine really Protected Areas Technical Team. I think they're breaking it. It was just the Marine Protected Areas Team, and now it's the Marine Protected Areas. There's another letter in there somewhere. Um, but there is actual substantive work taking place on this now. Uh, we have very, very strong commitments from the new government. Uh, they've committed to protect 5% of Canada's ocean by 2017. Um, that gives them, what, 18 months to increase by 3-4%. Um, good luck. We'll help them as much as we possibly can. And as Dana pointed out, um, RCA will play a really important role in that. Uh, there's 164 sites and they cover 5,000 square kilometres roughly in BC. That is a big chunk, so they will definitely play a role. Um, there are discussions to be had about what we need to do to RCAs to include them in the NPA network. Um, IUCN guidelines are actually pretty clear on what can happen in an MPA. Well, we, we read them as being pretty clear on what can happen in an MPA, uh, and it's generally no commercial fishing. Um, and the only other way that they could feed in is in this, there is this little loophole in the language that says MPAs and other effective means. Um, there is some debate about what another effective mean is an RCA, an, another effective mean to meet the target, um, or is it, does it need a bit more work? So um, those discussions are being had at levels above me. Um, we also have issues in measuring MPAs, as I've said, but generally the one thing when we start looking closely at Canada's MPAs, are, our standards are pretty poor. So from the conservation sector, our perspective is we don't want to accept any more half-assed MPAs at this point. Like, you have to improve things now. Um, we have most of the MPAs, I think two-thirds of MPAs in Canada don't explicitly prohibit oil and gas activities. Uh, there is almost no um, management of shipping activity. Um, less than one, I think it's 
0.1% of VC is in a no-take area, 0.01%. Um, it's very, very low. We really need to up our standards if we're going to actually effectively protect our coastal environments and ecosystems. That's it. So basically, spatial closure, MPA, not quite the same thing. Um, RCA will play a really important role in zoning and in MPA networks, but we need to up the protection. That's in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Any questions?